<laughs> you can imagine he gets into prison and he gets beat. <laughs> Jeff Skilling beats the shit out of him for being a snitch. Hello, welcome to another episode of Business Blaze, the least profession of all of my channels. But for some reason is about business. Uh, I am aware of the irony. People often say in the comments like, Simon, why is this channel the most informal, but about business? I don't know. <laughs> Well, I sort of do now. I was like, I should start a business channel. I think that would be fun because I like business and also I think people would watch it. And then I decided to make it casual because I wanted to do something different. Here we are. Danny has written us a script. Uh, did you see the video? Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, what happened at Theranos? This one is basic. That was, I really enjoyed doing that one. This one is the same thing. Just about Enron. Now, uh, let's just jump in, shall we? The year is 2000. Well, I don't mean it's the year 2000 right now. No one was doubting you meant that, Danny. What I'm trying to do here is mentally take us back to a time before the days of Ed Sheeran, when everyone was still playing Snake on their crap mobile phones, and Simon was still wearing long shorts and a school blazer. Year 2000, I was tw thir 12, 13. Ah, I think at secondary school, we didn't have shorts. We just had trousers. But if it was a year earlier, two years earlier, I would have been wearing shorts and a blazer. I was hoping that the Business Blaze channel might be able to afford a wibbly wobbly Scooby Doo style flashback effect, but failing that, we'll just have to make do with Simon shaking his hips or something. Well, <laughs> this channel is definitely not profitable right now at these viewer numbers, but uh, maybe someday, and I'm not really sure what the hip shaking reference is, someone enlighten me in the comments? Or failing that, we'll just have to imagine in our heads that it's the year 2000, and this is the longest introduction to a Business Blaze video ever. The American energy supplier. Enron Corporation is worth about $60 billion. It's employing 29,000 staff, and it has just been named as Fortune's most innovative company for the sixth consecutive year. <laughs> Look, there's one thing I do know about Enron. <laughs> if they were innovative about something, it's their accounting methods. The description energy supplier may be a little oversimplistic, as Enron actually gets up to all kinds of crazy they don't just provide electricity and gas, they sell commodities, they operate broadband and communication services, they produce pulp and paper, they sell video on demand in partnership with Blockbuster, and at one point, they effectively try to own the internet. As you might be able to guess, that last one didn't quite pan out. But you can't fault the burning ambition within the company. Fast forward just one year, that's 2001 for your maths fans out there, and the second biggest company in the US was under criminal investigation and has become the subject of the biggest ever corporate bankruptcy in US history at the time. I imagine still is, right? Has any other giant company gone back? I mean, many giant companies have gone bankrupt. I guess maybe Lehman Brothers, Best Ends. They weren't as big as Enron, were they? Today, the word Enron has become shorthand for deep corruption and massive fraud, which begs the obvious question, why did they choose such a rubbish name for the company? What's wrong with Enron? <laughs> I mean, I know it's because you're like, well, yeah, it's Enron, isn't it? Ha ha ha. But is the name actually that bad? Whilst we're dealing with that question, I'm hoping we might also be able to find some time to delve deeper into how exactly one of the most successful and acclaimed companies in the world managed to take such an undignified leap into the pit of oblivion. The origins of Enron can be traced back to the 1920s, although the company itself didn't come into existence until 1985. Enron was actually the result of a big merger between two relatively small regional companies called Houston Natural Gas and Internorth, who had been providing gas to local customers for decades. One of the three key players in this story is Ken Lay, an American businessman and devoted Republican. He was a figure with some pedigree having graduated in the top 5% of his class at Harvard Business School, and he went on to become the golfing partner of George Bush Sr., a business mentor to George W. Bush, and later on in the year 2000, he was a strong candidate to take on the post of United States Secretary of the Treasury, serving under his former pupil, who had the job title of president. That's pretty intense, considering what's about to happen next. <laughs> Ken Lay had been one of the big movers and shakers behind the merger that was to form Enron, and he quickly rose into the position of CEO of the company. Although Enron started out, simply as a natural gas provider for the first few years, in the 1990s, there was a huge change in the energy market thanks to the introduction of new deregulation laws, which opened up the doors to new suppliers around the US and the rest of the world. Enron took advantage of this evolving market by effectively transforming itself into an energy trading network for other suppliers, selling both gas and electricity to traders through fixed priced contracts, which diminished the risk of fluctuating energy prices for these new suppliers. Okay, I think if I understand that right, Enron basically became the middleman, sort of a market where other suppliers could buy money and insure themselves against like changes in prices in electrical gas. 
so that, you know, they wouldn't have any big shocks. And Enron being a larger company could absorb more financial shocks like that, I think. It's probably worth noting that everyday customers didn't really see any advantage from this. They were still paying top whack for their energy bills while the new suppliers were raking in the bigger profits and splashing out on ever bigger executive desk toys. Yeah, it's like, can you imagine <laughs> at the boardroom? So guys, uh, we've really seen like a significant reduction in uh, the, the cost of, you know, energy for us. We were thinking about passing this on to our customers. <laughs> Enron took the lead in the emerging energy futures market, which allowed companies and investors to speculate on fluctuations in energy prices. And they dabbled in the telecommunications industry too. All right. <laughs> my knowledge of, seeing as I did a degree in business, like my knowledge of like energy futures and shit is like this big. It doesn't really matter. I really don't think it's important for our story. In 1997, the company constructed an enormous top secret fiber optic network in Las Vegas, which ran for over a thousand miles and was intended to eventually become the backbone of broadband internet across America. The idea was that Enron would trade bandwidth to all US internet providers in much the same way they were already trading energy and that Enron would effectively own the internet in America. It's actually pretty smart. The long-term plan never came to fruition as the site was eventually auctioned off to Switch Communications for peanuts in 2002 following the bankruptcy of Enron. In fact, the auction was so quiet that the CEO of Switch Communications was the only one in attendance. So the bidding war wasn't very exciting to watch. Yeah, can you imagine? You're like, you walk into an auction and you're the only dude sitting there and the auctioneer's like, this isn't gonna go well for me, is it? <laughs> it's like, a hundred million dollars, 50 million dollars. 10 minutes later, four dollars, <laughs> one dollar. Anyone else? Going. <laughs> Today, Switch Communications doesn't exactly own the internet, but they do own one of the biggest data centers in the world. The second key player in this story is Jeff Skilling, another graduate from Harvard Business School who quickly rose through the ranks of Enron, having impressed Ken Lay with his ingenuity. One of Skilling's cunning plans was to revamp the way Enron approached its accounting by adopting a slightly dubious mark-to-market model. Now this, I'm pretty sure this is where things get st start getting, because Enron was fine, they were an energy company, they did stuff. I know there was some other shady stuff that was going on, but it's mostly about the accounting. So this is where it's gonna go wrong. <laughs> now, when it comes to my own accounting, I like to keep things fairly simple. I have a column for the amount of money I get paid and another column for vital expenses such as office equipment, swivel chairs, keyboards, I only see get through about four or five a year, and vital cartons of Mbongo. I haven't thought about Mbongo in about 20 years. It's like, I think it's a fruit drink and they had this thing Mbongo, Mbongo, it's made in the jungle. Something, 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 something. There's uh, that, that marketing stuck with me. <laughs> the mark to market model is a much more confusing way of going about things. And that was exactly the reason Skilling demanded its immediate implementation. Skilling's like, hey guys, you know a great way to confuse the shit out of our investors so they think we're worth way more money? Let's adopt a really confusing accounting standard. I wonder if Danny's gonna try and explain it to us. Yes. <laughs> the general idea is that you account for complex long-term contracts by estimating the present value of their future cash flow. What? <laughs> Wait, so you're like, yeah, I think we're gonna make this much money in the future, so let's just say we made this much money now. That's an accounting model? <laughs> Although accounting is super complicated, like one of the parts of that business degree was like studying accounting, which one, is incredibly boring, <laughs> and two, it's like, what? <laughs> Why is this, like, I mean, I feel for a small business, it's fairly simple, but when it starts getting into this giant corporate stuff, you're like, what is going on? So instead of reporting to investors how much actual profit has been made in the financial quarter, Enron's approach was to report projected future profit that hadn't actually been made yet, but appeared on paper to investors that it had. How is this an official, like an allowed accounting method and not just a scam? This was all very well in the 90s when business was booming for Enron and the future looked bright, but it was slightly less useful with competition when competition became fiercer and those predictions never quite materialized. It's quite remarkable that Enron were allowed to do this, you know, no sh and that the US Securities and Exchange Commission were happy to approve the accounting method in 1992. <laughs> was someone bribed? <laughs> like what the act? Maybe there's an accountant who's watching and could be like, actually Simon, the mark to market model is an incredibly effective accounting process for doing this. And then like, it'll be a really long comment and I'll just completely turn off. But this kind of thing was right at the very heart of the problem with Enron. Overcomplicated and misleading management of the books. A typical financial report from the company was so ridiculously complex that few investors would even try to understand it. They just saw the reported big profits on paper, clapped their hands in glee, and then went back to the golf course. A perfect example of this book fiddling is the deal that Enron struck with Blockbuster. In 2000, the two corporate giants signed a 20-year deal to work together on introducing new Newfangled video on demand to major US cities for the very first time. 
Video on demand in the year 2000. Bloody hell. They'll do it on that new fiber optic network they were gonna own. During the same period, Enron had also, I feel like this could be some alternate future thing where we got like, you know, Netflix in 2002 and Enron wasn't a complete piece of shit. During the same period, Enron had also struck a very secret deal with a Canadian bank who had agreed to loan Enron $115 million in exchange for all the profits from the first 10 years of the blockbuster deal. I feel like a deal that size for two public companies, I'm assuming the Canadian bank's public as well, shouldn't shouldn't be secret, guys. And how can it be secret? You've got public books. <laughs> Although, I guess that was the point. They had public books that were just super confusing. The problem is that the whole venture turned out to be a massive flop and Blockbuster withdrew from the contract just eight months later, leaving Enron with a big debt to pay back to the Canadian bank. However, the shifty accounting meant that the $115 million loan from the bank was simply counted as a nice big juicy profit of the financial reports with no indication to investors that Enron had messed up big time on this deal. How does that, this accounting method would be like, yeah, no, uh, I'm just gonna count my mortgage that I owe the bank as part of my net worth. That's an asset, not a liability. <laughs> the final key player is Andrew Fasto, a former banker who ended up serving in the post of Chief Financial Officer for Enron in 1998. Fasto was the mastermind behind the formation of several special purpose entities, or SPEs, which were effectively just small limited partnerships created with external parties, and in most cases, these are set up with perfectly sound financial intentions. <laughs> not with Enron, though. <laughs> Enron used SPEs as a dumping ground for any assets that were causing financial grief or concern. So essentially, if an asset was to generate a whopping loss for Enron, it would be mysteriously snapped up by one of Fasto's many SPEs, indicating yet another fresh profit for the main firm while leaving the SPE to soak up the losses far away from Enron's books and the eyes of investors. Wait, so it'd be like, well, we tried this thing. It was a complete financial failure. So we sold it to John. John's secretly a part of Enron, but he did. <laughs> he bought this piece of shit for a load of money. <laughs> How is this legal? Uh, those investors must have still felt happy in 2000. The stock price of the company had soared to a new record of $90 per share, and Enron was now worth $60 billion. Woo! The only problem was that this figure was about seven times its actual earnings and about six times its real book value. That's depressing. Journalists and experts were now beginning to get a little suspicious about the true value of Enron, and articles began popping up in the likes of Fortune magazine, which called the company's accountancy methods into question about a time. At this time, Enron was advising employees, investors, and the general public to keep throwing all their savings into Enron shares for, for a prosperous future, while the company executives were secretly steal it, selling millions of dollars of their own shares. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's illegal inside. Isn't that insider trading? And can you imagine what a piece of you have to be to be running this company that you're basically, you know, cheating on and driving into the ground. And while the stock price is going up, you're selling your shares to people who work for you. You little bitch. Knowing that it's all gonna go to sh it was as if they knew that the game might be up, yeah. The fact that the executives at the very top seemed to be playing a game of musical chairs couldn't have inspired much confidence either. Original founder Kenneth Lay had stepped down as CEO to be replaced by Jeff Skilling, who then very quickly resigned just six months later to be replaced by Ken Lay again. <laughs> Although Jeff Skilling cited personal reasons for his sudden and abrupt departure, it's now believed that he knew the accounting scandal was about to blow up in everyone's faces, and he didn't want to be sitting on the top of the tree when it happens. And who can blame him? In the face of increasingly big financial operational concerns and losses that were becoming too big for even Enron to hide, the investors lost all confidence in the company and by the end of 2001 the stock price had plummeted from $90 to just 20 cents. Mm. God, it would have been good to short sell Enron. <laughs> by this time, the CFO, Andrew Fasto, had already been fired from his post by Ken Lay after the company came under growing scrutiny from the press over Fasto's mysterious SPEs, and many of the major banks had been announcing that they would refuse to deal with Enron while Fasto remained with the company. It was later revealed that Fasto's vast labyrinth of off-the-books partnerships hadn't been just set up for Enron's benefit, it also managed to sneak tens of millions of dollars into his own pocket without anyone noticing. <laughs> it's estimated that investors lost $74 billion. I'm laughing about all of this stuff, but these investors were regular people and they were Enron's employees and these guys got Enron filed for bankruptcy in December 2001. The tens of thousands of employees hadn't just lost their jobs, many of them also lost their life savings and their pensions after the executives had encouraged them to pump everything into Enron shares while simultaneously flogging their own. They also managed to drag down a prestigious accounting firm with them. Arthur Anderson had been one of the biggest auditing tax and consultancy services since 1913, but they were forced to surrender their license in 2002 when it was revealed that they had been happily signing off on the dubious accounting practices of Enron for years and had 
then destroyed all documents relating to Enron before the investigators could sweep in. I started off feeling bad, like dragged down a prestigious accounting firm. Oh, that's sad. They've been around for ages. No, it turns out they were <laughs> Good. Another 85,000 jobs went down with Arthur Anderson. Okay, now I feel like a piece of because I'm making fun of this, but Arthur Anderson, you, you, you know, clearly this wasn't good, was it? Yeah, I hope those other 85,000 people found other jobs somewhere else and didn't have all of their life savings invested in Arthur Anderson's stock. Ben Lay was found guilty of 10 counts of securities fraud, but died in his cell of suicide, despite the fact that both cameras outside of his cell had been turned off. And <laughs> I'm just kidding. He died of a heart attack in 2006, just three months before he was due to be sentenced. George Bush Sr. was one of the attendees at the small private funeral, but he probably didn't bring his golf clubs with him on that day. Well, Obviously not, because one, it'd be incredibly inappropriate to big golf clubs to a funeral, and two, the guy that you play golf with is f***ed, isn't he? Jeff Skilling was originally sentenced to 24 months in prison after being found guilty of conspiracy inside of trading securities fraud, making false statements to auditors, although this was later reduced to 14 years, and he was released in 2019 after serving 12. Yeah, he was, he's up to something new, I think. I don't know if I'd invest in a Jeff Skilling business, though. In fact, I definitely would <laughs> Meanwhile, Andrew Fasto was sentenced to 10 years in prison after being found guilty of two counts of wire and securities fraud, but this was reduced to five years after he agreed to spill the beans on all his former Enron executives. Or in other words, he dodged five years in prison by singing like a canary. <laughs> you can imagine he gets into prison and he gets beat. <laughs> Jeff Skilling beats the sh him for being a snitch. Uh, the weird thing about Enron is they weren't really a terrible business. They did have innovative ideas. They were brilliant at launching new ventures, and it seems they had at least some talent for attracting investors. The main problem was they seemed to struggle with the day-to-day -day running of these brilliant ventures, and then devoted most of their time to hiding the true figures instead of just sorting out the business and getting back on track. Yeah, Enron was around for a really long time and seemed to be doing okay until they were like, let's just cook the books. Let's, let's just do that. <laughs> if anything good came out of this mess, it's the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which was passed as a law by US Congress as a direct response to the Enron scandal and serves to protect investors from fraudulent, from fraudulent financial reporting with stricter securities regulations and tougher penalties for those who step outside the line. It was signed into law in July 2002 by Ken Lay's former business pupil, George W. Bush. And around in the circle we have come. And more importantly, what about that rubbish name? I still disagree with Danny. I think Enron's a fine name. It's an energy corporation. It's, I mean, it's not exactly innovative or anything, but like Apple, Microsoft, Enron. And not that these companies are related. I'm just comparing names here. Chill out, lawyers. <laughs> it could have been even worse. Ken Lay's original choice was Enteron, and in fact, the company was very briefly christened with this name following the initial merger of Internorth and Houston Natural Gas. However, it was hastily rebranded as Enron when somebody pointed out that Enteron is actually the medical name of the digestive tract or gut which absorbs all the energy, nutrients, and goodness from food and expels the rest as waste. And that just wouldn't have been appropriate at all, except it would have been absolutely appropriate. Danny, thank you for putting this together. A whirlwind ride of joy as always. If you found this a whirlwind ride of joy, smash that like button. More important was you watched to the end and I appreciate you for doing that because it helps out in the YouTube algorithm when you watch to the end like this. Thank you and I'll see you next time.